Good morning. Thank you to all who are joining us online from the United States and beyond. My name is Kayla Orta and I'm the Senior Associate for Career Research here at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Today, we are delighted to welcome back Professor Kevin Gray, a former Wilson Center Fellow to discuss his most recent book titled, North Korea and the Geopolitics of Development. Currently, he is a professor in international relations at the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom. Kevin specializes in East Asia and political economic development with a particular focus on late development and state formation. We are greatly looking forward to hearing from Kevin on the geopolitics at play in his analysis of North Korean history and state formation. On the panel, he is also joined by Andrew Yeo, Senior Fellow and SK Korea Foundation Chair in Korean Studies at the Brookings Institution. A renowned Korea expert, Andrew is a professor of politics at the Catholic University of America here in Washington, DC. He has published extensively on both North and South Korea, currently spearheading the Brookings Project on South Korea's role in the Indo-Pacific region. In 2021, he published his latest book titled State, Society, and Markets in North Korea, which I'm sure he will draw upon for today's discussion. Also joining us is Rachel Minyoung Lee, Senior Fellow at the 38 North Program at the Simpson Center. Well established in her field, Rachel has considerable experience from her time in the US government, serving as a North Korea collection expert and analyst, formerly at the Vienna-based Open Nuclear Network. She recently joined the 38 North team at the Stimson Center, and we are delighted she could join us. To set the stage for today, we will be talking about North Korea, but in a context perhaps unfamiliar to many of our audience members, in particular, North Korean economy and state development. For many Korean watchers, it is hard to juxtaposition North Korean expansing and expanding nuclear weapons program against the backdrop of the impoverished domestic economy and dismal human rights situation. To repurpose a famous quote to fit today's discussion in particular, it can be said that North Korea is a dichotomy wrapped in enigma. While reading Kevin's book, what I found most interesting is how eloquently and in great detail he contextualizes North Korean history and development by bridging the distance between the question mark of North Korean domestic affairs and the familiar narratives of historical moments and movements in geopolitics within the region and beyond. At this point, I would like to turn it over to Kevin to hear what motivated you to develop this project, to hear more about your book in particular and in detail. What has the research journey been both before and after your book's publication? And most importantly, what are some of your key findings and implications for today's geopolitical situation? So now I will turn the microphone virtually over to Kevin. Thank you very much. And, and thanks uh, uh, also for this opportunity to talk about my book. And I should say, when, when I say my book, this is a co-authored book uh, with a colleague, uh, Lee Jong-un, in Hanshin University in South Korea. And th the book really um, sort of grew out of a few journal articles that we'd written together, which um, primarily dealt with how the North Korean economy and how the North Korean system, if you like, was uh, impacted by the rise of China, by the so-called China boom. Um, I, most, if not all, observers of North Korea have, have taken note of this, that the growth of cross-border trade, investment, the, the movement of people, has had has a, a really significant impact on, on, on the country. Um, but we felt that despite this, there was still a sense in which a lot of analysis of uh, North Korean political economy still kind of treats North Korea as a sui uh, a, a genesis uh, case. It, it uses an approach which um, we refer to as being methodologically nationalist, which is to say that um, you know, there's still this kind of view that the country is a kind of hermetic, well, hermit kingdom, right? Um, and um, we can explain outcomes within the country by talking about the Kim family, um, perhaps the inhibiting role of Juche ideology. I mean, this is not to say that these things are not important, but what we wanted to do in this book was to kind of situate North Korea within the kind of world historical context of uh, uh, development. So, uh, and, and to try to put at the very center how what we call the nexus between geopolitics and development operates in the North Korean context. So this is pretty clear, I think, when we talk about the rise of China and the impact that that had had, particularly in the 2010s on the North Korean economy. But we also extend that analysis further back and we look at uh, starting off with the colonial era and seeing how 
the kind of differential impact of colonialism and colonial industrialization um, sort of affected the genesis of the of the of the North Korean system. Um, I mean, scholars have done this in relation to South Korea. Uh, it's often referred to as colonial modernization theory. Um, we do this in the case of North Korea, but we also show um, not not simply as in the case of South Korea that this had a, a sort of positive impact, but also show how certain um, kind of trends or legacies of colonial development also led to. Um, features of the North Korean system that meant that later on um, it actually had trouble uh, adapting to uh, changes within the uh, international geopolitical environment. Uh, I'll explain a bit more about how that actually works later on. But there's the kind of colonial era of, of how geopolitics shape development. Um, we then go on to look at um, the Cold War and, and the early period of state formation, the launching of North Korea's industrialization uh, project. Um, we show how, for example, after the Korean War, there was this uh, huge um, effort to provide international aid to North Korea from the other socialist countries, um, which actually, if we if we look at the figures, kind of outsized the very substantial aid that the US gave to, to South Korea. And in some sense, this made possible North Korea's um, kind of project of, of uh, very, very rapid uh, structural change and heavy industrialization. Um, to the extent that by the end of the 1950s, North Korea had made this transition from being a, a war-torn country to a country that was not so different, at least in, 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 urban, in terms of urbanization and, and the size of its industry. Um, not so different to what you found in the advanced, more advanced countries of Eastern Europe. Um, so, um, but this is not to say necessarily that um, geopolitics determines outcomes within North Korea. We, 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 we are clear to make the case that this is kind of refracted and mediated through uh, domestic processes, domestic political struggles. So we look at, um, you know, the, the uh, so-called factional politics of, of, of the mid-1950s and show um, how this was also it wasn't just about political factions, it was also about divergent ideas about development. Uh, and of course, with the um, ultimate victory of Kim Il-sung's sort of Manchurian guerrilla uh, uh, faction, that sort of led and made the space for a continuation of a strategy that fundamentally um, favoured uh, heavy industrialization as the basis of a, a, a later on a, a strong kind of uh, defence uh, uh, industry. Um, and, and, and also the, the geop geopolitical contest continues to play a significant role in the way that it presented a kind of security threat to uh, North Korea. Of course, we can say that North Korea also contributed to, to this security threat that it was faced with. But nonetheless, uh, I think it, it, it's fair enough to say that North Korea was, was um, one half of a divided state and has always had this kind of existential question uh, hanging uh, uh, over it. And, and without the kind of stable uh, geopolitical alliances that, say, South Korea had with the United States. Um, so that's the analysis that we put forward in terms of uh, pretty much the first four chapters of the book and see how um, the international context um, uh, and, and domestic development with, with North Korea were, the, were this kind of interlinked, mutually constitutive process and how that led to the emergence of the North Korean system. But then the question is, what did this, this tell us? So this is, um, uh, we, we do this as a means of trying to shed light on the distinctiveness of um, uh, North Korea compared to sort of other similar um, uh, socialist states, China and Vietnam, for example, um, which, which, which again, doesn't make reference simply to the choices of the leadership or particular ideological factors, but try to see it in, in a, as part of a longer historical uh, uh, process. So, um, obviously, you know, most, if not all, um, analysts of the North Korean economy have um, looked at marketization as being one of the the key um, kind of trends in North Korean political economy since the crisis of the 1990s. Um, it's often referred to as a, as a process of marketization from below. So it's understood uh, typically as a process of the weakening of the role of state control and an increasing private 
space uh, in which uh, citizens um, are able to sustain their livelihood through engaging in market, market practices. But um, I think this is this is true. Um, but it's also um, it's 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 doesn't present the whole picture. I think um, particularly when there's a kind of um, what often an explicit or, or or even just implicit understanding that the emergence of a market society in North Korea is is actually going to be a, a source of resistance a, a, against the state. So, um, first of all, what we do is we we kind of question this distinction, which is a kind of ontological distinction between the state and the market, which I think exists. That that distinction is somewhat problematic in any national context, but in North Korea as well. Um, the, the, what we try to shed light on is how marketization is is also a process that has been selectively and strategically uh, uh, pursued by by the state as a means of the state seeking to reproduce its own its own existence. Um, so you know it, it is the case after the crisis people didn't have much choice but to resort to market activities. But but uh, um, and, you know and this, this this included the selling of food and clothes and daily necessities and and, and, and these kind of things. But it, it and, and and many of the goods that were being sold were sourced from China. So we cannot really discuss marketization in North Korea without talking about these these cross border kind of uh, supply chains, networks, trading trading net networks. Um, which again points to the fact that this that this has these kind of international dimensions to it as well, which we're trying to draw uh, a, a, a attention to. Um, so um, the, the the process of marketization has kind of transformed the economy, and it's it's transformed the the the, the, the service industries, uh, uh, the housing sector, transport, uh, distribution, and the state has. Um, not really have much choice but to not just accept this but in some ways try to um to some degree formalize these processes without acknowledging you know cap capitalist concepts like the private property rights and things like that but but in a way also trying to tax for example the introduction of new taxes that try to um uh increase state revenues which are extracted from these mar marketizing processes so in the, in the book we talk about this to to, to quite a, 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 a significant extent um and it's also about the state uh, actually establishing new market areas so for example the mobile phone telecommunication sector is a sector that could not exist without uh, the state taking a, a a a leading role, and 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 mobile phone communications are are significant, of course, because this is actually an underpinning and a spur of further uh, uh, kind of marketization. So that's in in terms of the state's relationship with the market, which we think is a bit more uh, kind of nuanced and 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 uh, uh, mutually dependent than than at least some analysis kind of suggest although we're not necessarily the first people to, to sort of shed light on this. Um, but we also, in the book, we, we, we um, examine how, um, what, what the state's approach is to uh, economic reform. Um, obviously, there are various kinds of reforms that we could talk about, that I could talk about now. So agricultural, you know, special economic zones, things like this. I'll just talk a little about the uh, socialist enterprise uh, responsibility management system, because that's, that's particularly... Uh, uh, illuminating. So in contrast to the reforms of the early 2000s, what's distinctive here is, of course, the, this has been given a, a, a sort of um, firm legal basis within the sort of economic planning law and the enterprise law. Um, and it, 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 certainly the, the idea of planning has not been discarded. I mean, if you look at North Korean publications, I mean, they're always talking about planning, right? I mean, and, and there's never been a departure from the idea that the North Korean economy is fundamentally a planned economy. But um, the way that uh, the sort of um, the plans that are handed down by the State Planning Commission uh, has, has changed and there's much more an, an emphasis now um on the uh not just the central index but also the regional and the enterprise uh, index which shows how um north korean enterprises uh under the that are under the system uh are increasingly expected to be self-sustaining and take responsibility for their own performance and also take responsibility for their uh, uh employees as well and 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 under this enterprise index creating their own their own uh, uh plans um 
and in the process also, of course, paying uh, uh, taxes from the state. And, and so this is this uh, socialist enterprise responsibility management system is a replacement of the old uh, Tian uh, 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 management method, and and um, which which also suggests that um, you know the Tian work system uh, management system was established by Kim Il Sung, and, and and it's significant that this was actually explicitly abandoned by the North Korean state through the um, uh, revision of the uh, uh, constitution. And what's significant also is. Um, this uh, explicit recognition of the notion of um, uh, the idle, idle, what they call idle money, which is which is basically the savings of private uh, citizens. Um, I, 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 I know R Rachel has written about this in, in a lot more detail than we we did in the book, but but it's uh, we you know to make the point that um, this is is kind of an implicit recognition of the fact that there is private capital and there are private entrepreneurs, the the, the tonju, without actually mentioning uh, them. I should just say also, of course, that this this um, socialist enterprise responsibility management system is also quite. Um, uh, you know, there are questions about how widely it's been rolled out. I, I don't believe it's it's meant to apply to every single enterprise. Of course, you still have core industries and enterprises that are considered to be strategic and come much more under the, the state's plan but I, but I, but I, but the, the these enterprise reforms are probably for uh, enterprises that are a little bit lower down in, in the hierarchy of um north korean enterprises and are by the very nature already sort of more implicated in in sort of marketizing uh, uh um, uh, processes, but it does show also um, that there it seems to be emerging a kind of a, a, a mutual dependence between different sectors of the North Korean economy. In the sense that you have these more marketized enterprises that are, that are making profits. Uh, ideally, uh, the state is then taxing them, um, but then it's using the, those taxes. Um, well, it could be using them for many things, but 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 one would assume it's also to support the kind of the the sort of core heavy industries that aren't as easily able to um, make profits within the marketized economy. Um, so uh, the market is therefore seen as a as as a means uh, as a, a strategic means of supporting the the old traditional sort of socialist type industries and enterprises. Um, which is not so different in the way that the market emerged in China actually is a, also seen as a, a means to an end, not a, not, a, not an end in itself. Um, but I guess, you know, to, to, to think about that China link, link I, I think probably what's quite different in, in, the China, in, in the North Korean reforms is that there is still this very strong notion of um, units such as enterprises, or you could talk about collective farms as well, as a, a kind of a, a locus of social control. So within the reforms, there doesn't seem to be any indication that the North Korean state is, is likely to tolerate a, a, a labor market, for example. It will not also abol abolish the collective funds. And, it, and I think there's still this idea that people need to be attached to a, 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 a particular uh, uh, unit. So that's, that's um, even though there are many parallels between the North Korean reforms and, and, the, and the early 1980s Chinese reforms, I would say that was one of the, one of the significant differences which I can talk, talk about. Now, one, one thing we do also say in the book, and, and this links back to the sort of more of the longer durée of North Korean development, is that um, you know we can talk about reforms and, and often people look at the reforms and trying to determine whether there's any indication um, North Korea may go along uh, a sort of a Chinese, um, a Vietnamese kind of uh, trajectory. But but I think, um, you know, drawing on, on, on the work that Jeffrey Sachs and, uh, did in, in the 1990s, that we, we do need to realize that North Korea is a very different kind of political economy to the Chinese or Vietnamese uh, economies. Um, because as, as, I, as I said, and as we show in the book, North Korea did actually go through its process of sort of industrial modernization and development in the 1950s, whereby resources were transferred from the rural sector to, to uh, modern industries and to the urban areas. So the challenge for North Korea is, is uh, well, it can't really do that process again. Uh, the challenge is more a process of structural adjustment. And, and this, is, this is a real challenge because, um, you know, there's a, there's a whole literature on the political economy of sectors, uh, which show that heavy industry with high sunk costs 
tends to lead to a kind of conservatism because it creates vested interests and, and the managers of big state and enterprises don't want to lose out to um, sort of smaller forms of capital or to, to foreign capital, for example. Um, and, and you get, a, therefore, a much more cautious and conservative approach to economic reform. And I think we can sort of assume that this is what's taking place in North Korea, even if we don't know the actual processes whereby policy is formulated. And we can see this also um, actually within countries. So if you look at China, for example, if you look at the northeast of China, um, uh, the Heilongjiang, Jilin, uh, uh, Liaoning provinces. I mean, that's the old industrial heartland of China where there were huge, heavy state-owned enterprises. It's also the part of China that was um, somewhat behind when it came to economic reform. In the early years, there was resistance. Um, it's still now a, 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 a region um, which has, has sort of... Um, a bit of a rust belt and has fallen behind and doesn't have the same kind of economic vitality uh, of other places. Similar, similarly to North Korea, it's also the part of China that has the strongest uh, sort of colonial memories as well. And so I, I would suggest that if, if for some reason um, the northeast of China were a separate state, it would have a lot more in common. Um, with North Korea than it would with the with the rest of China. So there is a the, my point is there is a sense in which the kind of the heavy industrialization um, sort of path pursued by North Korea for, for historical and, 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 as I say, geopolitically determined reasons does create particular challenges and, and, and um, uh, resistances to, to uh, uh, reforms. So that's a geopolitical context that has a longer history, but also, also of course, we can think about the, the, the current context as well. If we're, if we're looking for signs of Chinese and Vietnamese style economic reform in North Korea, we, we, we can't fail to talk about the, the current context in which um, North Korea regards its external environment as very threatening, therefore potentially undermining any efforts at, at, at kind of marketizing reforms, such, such as, um, you know, special economic, economic zones and things like that. And obviously sanctions as well, which I don't really need to say, uh, sanctions is, is, is a pretty... Um, a uh, huge uh, uh, barrier. Um, uh, so those are, those are kind of immediate kind of um, um, factors which are which are holding North Korea back from a, a, a more proactive form of uh, reform. Um, but it's not just about that. It's it, as I say, it's about these kind of longer term historical trends. So that's um, my sort of attempt to try to uh, say what the book is about. Obviously, there's a lot more to it than I couldn't even sort of hope to try to uh, uh, sort of even summarize it now. But I, but hopefully I've said a bit about what we we wanted to do, to do with the book and where it fits in with, with some of the other uh, lecture. But I, I would actually really like to um, hear others' views and, and, and also hear some questions, which I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Kevin. I think you did a really great job of contextualizing the book within the time period. So talking about China's rise. And I think you gave us a little bit of a sneak peek in how much detail that is in your book, how deeply you go into the conversation of the market dynamics and the economic policy. And I think for anybody who's focusing on North Korea that was wanting to look at something maybe beyond the security dynamics, um, this is a really interesting space. I do want to turn it over to Andrew. But before I do that, I want to give ask you one more question. I know the book had focus very well on talking about those historical moments and movements. And you had spoken to the China rise context. And I know you and your co-author had also defined the colonial experience as well as the Cold War. Um, is there anything you also would like to say about maybe why those three um, individual time periods were selected? Or if there's other context there that you'd like to add? You went very deep into the economic policy. And I think for our listeners, they'd also be curious about the geopolitical, why those three segments of um, experiences for North Korea stood out in your research. Yeah, I mean, I think those three periods pretty much cover the whole of North Korean history, really. So um, I, th I, uh, I mean, the, I, th I think it was important to mention the colonial period because it's something that's often not analyzed in, with respect to North Korea. There is quite a literature on, on, on South Korea explaining North Korea's, uh, sorry, South Korea's uh, success. But I think in the case of North Korea, it did two things because um, the sort of heavy and the, the, there was quite a, you know, the emergence of, of 
sort of heavy industry under Japanese colonialism, which was located more in the north than in the south. So if you look at a lot of um, North Korea's uh, sort of key uh, industrial plants, a lot of them had colonial origins. And so I think there's a case to, to argue that at the end of the colonial era, even though it was called, it was unbalanced and 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 had and and sort of deformed in certain ways, but for for a country that's just come out of colonialism, it 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 it, it had a, a fairly significant uh, degree of uh, industrialization, which I think made its industrialization after during the Cold War much more of a feasible project to to uh, pursue. So I think I think it's important to recognize that, and also the the very notion of uh, national development came out of the post colonial experience. So I think that was important. The Cold War thing, I, I mean, I I think that's that's it, it's it, we can't not talk about that because that's the whole formation. I, I mean, I was talking about massive international aid that went to North Korea, which enabled. Um, this this kind of path and then and then of course the, the collapse of that cold war system as well created the conditions for um the famine of the 1990s um because um in in some ways you could say that north korea had overdeveloped to a degree during the cold war period in the sense that for example it developed an agricultural system that was extraordinarily uh, energy dependent and without um those kind of um geopolitical alliances, um, the Soviet Union and China willing to continue to have these soft trading arrangements in with regard to energy. Um, so I think I, I think that's that, that 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 that's also crucial. And then the rise of China, of course, that was where we start that was where we started from in the sense saying that the the the, the, the sort of Korean um, uh, China trade was central central to this whole process. Um, there, there is a, a legitimate question about what's happened over the last few years, but I, 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 I first I think I'll stop there, and then and then perhaps I'd like to, if we could have some questions, that would be great. Fantastic. Thank you. I think that helps us, for especially for our audience members who are going to hopefully read the book later if they haven't already, that kind of pulls in the context um, a little bit more deeper for the conversation around geopolitics. So now I will turn it over to our first of our discussants, um, Andrew Yeo. It's over to you. Hi, thanks, Kayla. And it's a real privilege to be able to talk about Kevin and his co-author, Yi Jong-un's book on North Korean geopolitics of uh, de development. And I remember, Kevin, when you were uh, at the Wilson Center, this is 2017, 2018, and it was such a great time because you and Pat McEachern and Jean Lee were there. So all these great North Korea um, experts. And I felt the couple of times I popped over to Wilson Center and saw you in D.C. was a real treat. And that's I believe that's the first time I actually met you as well, too. So it's wonderful to see what's developed uh, since then. And of course, this book is really a it's it's really a true piece of scholarship. It's hard to come by books these days on North Korea that offer rich historical and theoretical context, but still shed some useful light into contemporary North Korea politics. And I think you did it right because the book does have shelf life. That's the, the advantage of having historical elements in it. It's not like something will happen tomorrow and suddenly we the book is useless. So, so good thinking on your part. Um, you know, one of the book's greatest strengths is the author's ability to bring both the internal and external dynamics together, describing North Korea's economic development in the broader context of geopolitics. And um, Kayla, I think, as you mentioned, we tend to compartmentalize discussion on North Korea's economy from conversation on security and geopolitics. But the authors really did a fantastic job fusing these two lines of thought together to address this develop, uh, development geopolitical ne nexus. And I mean, I, I'm gonna just pose a question now and you can answer it later, Kevin, but I'm curious if you know, at the time, you know, this was still, I mean, Kim Jong-un uh, in 2017, so he had been in power for about six years. And I remember they talked a lot about the Pyongyang strategy, the parallel line where uh, Kim Jong-un was focused on both uh, developing the economy, but also building nuclear weapons. Now, nuclear weapons isn't geopolitics, it's it's security, but it's he has these nuclear weapons because he's thinking about geopolitics. I don't know if that somehow shaped your thinking a little bit as well, because just in the early years of Kim Jong-un, we were talking so much about development plus um, security, and that's kind of dropped out these days, and we're again just focusing a lot on uh, the security situation and the geopolitics, but I'm curious uh, if that had any play, if that played in at all in, in you and uh, 
Professor Lee's uh, thinking on North Korea. Um, in terms of the attention to geopolitics, you know, I think the book does a great job providing new perspective to some well-trodden assumptions about North Korea's economic and state development. And it just reminds observers of contemporary North Korean politics why North Korea behaves in the manner that it does. You know, oftentimes we just say, well, North Korea, it's all about self-reliance and everything comes from within or from the mandates or the um, desires and wishes of the Kim family. But, you know, I, I think just to take one chapter, chapter three, I think Kevin um, and uh, Jong Wen they provide a useful reminder when and why North Korea became a highly militarized state. You know, I have reporters asking constantly, you know, why is North Korea so focused on its weapons? Uh, but you know, if you if you look at this chapter, the authors illustrate how geopolitical events of the 1960s, such as the Vietnam War, um, led Kim Il Sung to believe that the U.S. had shifted from a defensive to an offensive military posture in Asia. And during this period, we also had the normalization of South Korea-Japan relations, and that also plays into this fear of a US-Korea-Japan triangle. Um, and, uh, you know, that sounds oddly familiar today, where we have US-Japan-Korea tri uh, triangle uh, strengthening. So this isn't the first time we've seen this, uh, but that's a period where North Korea really ramps up militarization in the 1960s. 1970s, and it's it has to do with the geopolitical context. So there are parallels to that period as uh, to to today. Um, same thing with uh, Juche. You know, Juche doesn't develop in a domestic vacuum, but as Kevin uh, and Tongun uh, again point out, its uh, its ideological implementation unfolds during the Sino-Soviet split when Moscow had curtailed a lot of its economic and military assistance to North Korea. So where, what I wanted to just talk about with Kevin in the few minutes we have is, is really about what uh, happens next or what the book's implications are for where uh, for, for this uh, particular moment. And so Kayla, you, you asked Kevin to, uh, about the three geopolitical moments that he brings up, uh, Japanese colonial rule of the Cold War and the rise of China. And I think Kevin uh, provided some responses to why he focused in on those uh, critical junctures, but I want to ask you, Kevin, if you think we're in the midst of a fourth critical juncture in terms of geopolitics because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and we're hearing so much about, um, and we, we're definitely hearing about geopolitics and how we're seeing this alignment between Russia and North Korea and possibly China, uh, how will that affect North Korea's uh, development trajectory or just its traje political trajectory writ large? Um, so I'm wondering if you had some thoughts there. Um, and uh, I guess the, I'll just ask one other question and let you respond, and then we can go back and forth from there. But the other one has to do with states and markets. You know, it's a, a topic that's also very dear to my, myself, but I think your book was extremely helpful in informing my own thinking about the way states, society, and markets um, interact in North Korea. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right in your book, you talk about how the state shapes markets, that they're very closely intertwined, but you also talk about how the markets had begun to take off within North Korea. Uh, you know, since the book has written, since the book has published, we now see though that the state has reasserted its authority over markets and it's walked away from some of its decentralization efforts, at least, at least for the time being. So I was wondering you know, if you could just say something about the shift uh, what would explain this? Uh, you know, is does somehow COVID play into this? COVID is not again not geopolitics. It's it's you know yeah this global pandemic. It's another external shock. But I'm wondering if maybe COVID can be wrapped into your uh, framework of the geopolitics development nexus. But I'm wondering if you could just offer some insights into what's happening right now regarding North Korea's economy. So over to you, Kevin. Okay. Um... Actually, in some ways, those questions are all interlinked in a quite a sort of uh, a, a, a nice way as well. I mean, you, your first thing was about the uh, Pyongyang uh, uh, policy, and uh, and you're right that the origins of that was uh, in uh, under Kim Il Sung in the 1960s, where the, where the term comes from, I believe. 
um, and then it was raised again in the, in the 2010s. Although the direction of travel is is, is slightly different, so um, I, I I believe that in the 1960s it was a shift towards saying, well, we can't just focus on economic development; we also need to create a kind of military security uh, a sector which can support our autonomy and all this kind of thing. But I think under Kim Jong Un, it was slightly the, the other way around of of, of 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 travel. But then, of course, by the late the 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 late 2010s um the the the, the that that was kind of dropped basically and then uh kim jong-un de declared that um you know missile nuclear development that's that's been done now so now we're we're all out for the economy and that's i, I think that reflects again the kind of uh an assessment by uh the north korean leadership that the in in terms of their geopolitical position they were in a fairly kind of sort of optimistic you know situation in the sense that um you know that the peace process was, was was picking up speed and it looked like there was progress to, to be made there and so that seemed to be a, 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 a perhaps a you know a offering you know this saying that you know okay we've done all this missile testing and nuclear tests and then now we can fo focus on the economy so um but then of course that's that's changed again and that's much more about what's what's happened uh, uh since since then particularly after the the collapse of the Han hanoi summit and that that links i think to to your, to your other questions and and that's um uh yeah yeah so um i mean in terms of the book i mean yeah it's a little bit inconveniencing that 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 uh suddenly there's this there's this kind of shift and this rise of china moment doesn't seem to be as prevalent now and that links to the issue of marketization but in some ways i think that the, the the main claims that we're making st still hold because of the shift in north korea's external uh environment has has very very explicitly it's led to a shift in economic policy um an emphasis on 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 self-reliance and an, an emphasis on increasing internal uh resources because the the the, the kim jong-un has kind of lost his his kind of faith and the ability to make a breakthrough with the united states and south korea um so there's the the the, the there's a the, the, there's a kind of a, a very kind of um clear uh link there i mean i would just say with um the state's reassertion of control over the market i mean that's certainly the the discourse right and 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 it, it does seem that covid uh, i mean covid is kind of geopolitical in a way because the north um korea's response to the pan north korea's response to the pandemic was very much based on its sort of hyper vigilant state and this understanding of external threats everywhere i mean we saw this earlier with um the ebola crisis in 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 africa where north korea also decided to close its borders which seems quite an extreme uh, uh response but you know that's given the distance but it, but um so so there's something about what shaped that response in terms of how it's responded i mean uh, it is true that there seems to be a push by the state to, um, you have to be careful. If you say reassert control, um, it can sometimes suggest a return to the planned economy, but I don't think that's what's happening. I think the state is trying to um, sort of monopolize kind of market activities that were previously the tonju had played a, a significant uh, uh, role in so if you if you see for example the i mean one of the key manifestations of this is um the these new uh rice selling uh, grain selling stations i don't know i don't know exactly how you say it in english yangok panmeso um, where they've said that you can no longer sell rice in the mark in the general markets it has to be sold at these particular points that are controlled by the state but it's interesting that the they use the word panme which uh, means to sell and not you know say for example the word pegup which means to distribute right there still uh, implies some kind of market transaction and if you look at the prices that they're selling um rice at um, they they are sort of linked, if a bit lower, um, by, by the reports that I've read, to market prices. So it's not a complete 
you know, getting rid of market forces, but it seems to be the state is trying to um, uh, monopolize those market processes and, and, and shut out the uh, the um, uh, tonju, which, which I think is quite an interesting development. There's also been reports recently that the state has mandated companies to increase wages in state-owned enterprises by a very significant amount, which is actually quite similar to what, what the state did in in the um, July 1st reforms in the early 2000s, which were seen as a, actually trying to make, you know, the kind of nominal state prices closer to market prices. So it's it, it, it's it's an interesting mix, I, I think. It's 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 not as straightforward as saying, you know, states getting rid of the market. It's it's more like to me, it seems more like the state is trying to insert itself into these processes more. I, I, I'll stop there. I didn't quite get to all your questions, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure Rachel also has some questions as well. Thank you. We'll turn it over to Rachel. Uh, many thanks to Kevin for his concise yet thorough uh, review of his, book, of his book and to the Wilson Center for creating a platform for today's uh, timely discussion. I would like to echo Andrew's uh, shout out to Kevin for connecting geopolitical factors um, and North Korea's domestic economic policy. Uh, for me, the nexus between North Korea's economic development and the external environment uh, is an important topic that is often overlooked. Uh, the topic is particularly relevant and timely today as we find ourselves trying to wrap our minds around what many of us are now calling North Korea's uh, strategic shift. I would like to add two things uh, to what Kevin has kindly outlined in his overview of his book, and I also have two questions for, for Kevin. Uh, the first thing I'd like to add to uh, what Kevin has said earlier is um, that there is no denying that North Korea's economic policies have been shaped by the external environment. I would like to note that it is it also appears to work the other way around, where Pyongyang's interest in and intent to develop the economy uh, drives its foreign policy. Um, Kevin illustrates very well how geopolitics have shaped North Korea's economic policies. Uh, historically, there has been a clear pattern of North Korea shifting to diplomacy when it prioritizes economic development and intends to give impetus to market-oriented policies, which we reform, like uh, conveniently uh, uh, refer to as reform. So North Korea sometimes uh, refers to a favorable external environment, and that is in reference to an environment where Thanks to less tensions in the region, it can reduce investment in national defense and concentrate on economic development. And to reduce tensions, diplomacy and engagement, especially with the West, including the United States, are required. And uh, we have seen the connection between Pyongyang's increased diplomatic outreach and economic development um, in the lead up to and following the launch of Kim Jong-il's economic uh, reform measures in July 20, 2002, and also similarly um, in early 2018, uh, in the lead up to a major policy shift from Pyongyang or the parallel development of nuclear forces and the economy um, to concentrating everything on the economy. The second thing that I um, wanted to add um, was that um, Kevin provided a thorough overview of Kim Jong-un's reform measures, including his hallmark uh, reform initiatives, um, CERMs, or uh, the Socialist Economic Responsibility Management System. Um, the one thing I would like to add here is uh, that um, the current state status of uh, North Korea's economic reform, unfortunately, um, doesn't seem very good. Um, at, I think at best, we might say the country's reform has come to a standstill, and a slightly more negative and bold assessment would be that the North's reform uh, seems dead for the foreseeable future. And I base this assessment on uh, my reading of North Korea's state media, the frequency um, of uh, their references to certain formulations um, and the fact that they are practically never mentioned at any authoritative levels um, since early 2022. And of course, um, a notable trend in recent years um, seems to be that North Korea's justification of increased defense spending, um, um, and they do this by arguing that 
um, strong national defense allows for stable economic growth. And this is the same logic that Kim Jong, North Korea liked to use during Kim Jong-il's military first days, or even during Kim Jong-un's Pyongyang years um, before uh, it made a policy transition to everything for the economy. And North Korea's recently launched 2010 policy, which is all about revitalizing uh, local economies, um, from my point of view, appears aimed at giving appears aimed at giving priority to the civilian economy. But um, I am skeptical because um, of what we're seeing on the North Korean foreign policy front um, and the focus on longer term conflict rather than rather than engagement. So um, turning to Kevin, um, I just had two questions. Um, the first is in the current geopolitical context, where do you see North Korea going with its economic reforms? Do you think there is any motivation on North Korea's part to proceed with reform? Um, because it seems to be doing fine, one might even argue better uh, with greater central control. For example, in 2023, it claims to have made some economic growth. Um, and my second question to you is, uh, you talk about China's rise as one of the inflection points for North Korea's economic policy. How do you see the ongoing cooperation between North Korea and Russia um, affecting North Korea's current economic policy and even um, its historically heavy economic reliance on China? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much for your comments. There's 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 a lot there. I'll, I'll just focus quickly on your on on your on your questions first. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, my, my my assessment of the economic reforms is pretty much the same same as yours. Uh, in the sense that I think, um, I mean, those those reforms, those legal measures, they are they are still sort of on the books legally. They 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 still exist, and 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 you can find certain references to them within within the media. But there's certainly not the kind of um, sort of emphasis emphasis that we saw pre pre uh, I guess pre pre COVID. So, uh, and and that suggests that a su successful process of of reform does does require require favorable sort of international relations and and that's and, and and we've actually seen this before i think the sort of ebbing and flowing of reform measures that, that, that um uh, maybe not determined but at least sort of coincide with shifts in the external environment to, to to an extent um i mean i do i mean obviously we need to divide up those reforms i mean certainly such things as um establishing economic zones and things is not a priority anymore and is, is, is that that seems to have completely um uh, uh, stopped um and also given that's what what's happening with with the tonju i mean i i guess those those aspects that are trying to integrate um collective farms and enterprises into the sort of flows of private capital uh, are, are certainly not going to be as relevant anymore. I mean, there are still sort of kind of classic social market socialist measures, or maybe I shouldn't say market socialist measures, but measures that are there to increase um, kind of incentives, for example, which is a, which is a long standing problem in, in, in planned economies, right? Um, uh, and and I guess those in theory could be separated. Um, they 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 don't necessarily kind of uh, uh, run counter to um, or come up against uh, you know those, those those trends that I've just talked about. Um, in, in, uh, so so in in theory you could you could still see that there might be certain forms of experimentation in terms of um, uh, keep, you know an example is the field responsibility system for example and the size of the the sub work teams, which which was reduced, and uh, I've not seen any evidence to say that the reforms have actually been reversed. But I think, yeah, uh, overall, definitely, I think I, I, I think what what you're saying is 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 a consequence of the changed geopolitical context uh, in the last couple of years. Um, in terms of Russia, of course, I mean, I don't think there's any way that Russia is likely to um, play the kind of role that China played. Uh, I mean, certainly not in terms of a kind of cross-border 
uh, economy because that part of Russia is very undeveloped and, is, and, and it doesn't have those kind of dynamics of, of the spatial fix of capital that you had in, 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 in the northeastern Chinese uh, uh, provinces. Um, so, um, but it's, I mean, yeah, it's, it's obviously very difficult to know exactly what North Korea is getting, uh, and I and I wouldn't sort of pretend to know. Um, but but all, what I could say is, um, I mean, it seems it seems crazy now to think about it. But the mid two thousand and tens, things were actually looking fairly positive for North Korea. There was trade coming in, there was investment coming in. It was having impacts that was having a a, a positive impact on the daily life of, of of at least a percentage of the North Korean uh, uh, population. But um, uh, I think now, I personally, I'm I'm a lot more uh, pessimistic about um, uh, what's happening. I mean, if we look at the economic situation now, um, I mean, it's certainly better than last year. Food production is better. Um, trade with China has recovered a bit. So you could say the glass is half full. But then, if we compare the current situation now to um, say 2017. I mean, certainly North Korea has not recovered to that extent, and I don't see much potential for the, for that to happen because it's partly about sanctions as well. Um, and it's interesting when you look at um, some of the key indicators that we have on prices and exchange rates. It shows a kind of recovery. You know, the currency has gone back to this eight thousand one per dollar. I mean, I don't know how they kind of maintain that. It's a, it's a mystery, but 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 it seems to be extraordinarily sort of stable uh, and gone back to its previous kind of um, uh, uh, level and prices as well. But 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 that's kind of problematic because if prices of, of corn and rice have gone back to um, what they were before COVID, but you have a massive reduction in market activity, uh, then then presumably there's a lot of people in North Korea who can't afford those those prices um and and purchasing power is much re reduced so um putting all these things together in the picture of reform um i mean all i can say is i i think um that the geo despite north korea's closening relations with uh russia i i i think in terms of overall development which is kind of what we were interested in um it's uh, the the picture is looking pretty pretty bleak and, uh, and and there's a lot we don't know actually about what that bleakness means in terms of political stability and, and political rule and all, and all these kind of things the words we're getting from kim jong un all sound um very positive and everything's great but but um i i have huge kind of doubts about really what's happening to you know the daily lives of North Koreans and, and, and this kind of thing. So yeah, yeah. Um, Kevin, can I ask you a um, follow up question? Um, my one of my biggest concerns when I look at um, the North Korean economy these days is because, in spite of stalemated diplomacy with the U.S., um, and in spite of the years of international sanctions. Um, and despite the fact that uh, the country remained closed for nearly four years um, during the global pandemic, you know, there was a lot of concern about North Korea's um, economy going down and under. But not only did it manage to survive, um, it also made advancements um, in weapons programs. And um, it appears to have made some attained some economic growth in 2023. So, um, and this was in the midst of their drive for greater central control over the economy. So um, going back to what I said about my biggest fear when it comes to the North Korean economy is that I fear that the North Korean leadership is looking at all of this and thinking, well, you know, greater centralization works better than reform. Mm. Um, so why should we make efforts to continue with market-oriented initiatives. Um, so that's that's something I worry about. And mm -hmm. in that context also, since the North Korean economy has not only survived, but again, in 2023, managed to attain some growth, what does this mean for the North Korean leadership's thinking in terms of US, the strategic value of the US? Because one of the thing, one of the um, 
what one thing that the Pyongyang leadership, as I understand it, has always looked toward, looked for, looked for in in improving relations with the U.S. Um, was to create that stable external environment in which it could um, develop the economy. Um, so in that sense, improved relations with the U.S. was crucial. Hmm. But if, again, they can do that without the U.S., then does the U.S. hold as much strategic value for North Korea um, as it used to? It's just curious about what you think about that. I mean, that's that's the key, key question, right? But um, I mean, first of all, I, I would say that in terms of what the North Korean leadership is interpreting, I, I mean, one of the things I find quite odd and a bit difficult to get my head around is the fact that, um, you know, political economists have been saying, and uh, North Korean observers have been saying for a long time, that marketization is irreversible in, in, in North Korea, right? Um, and But now it seems that, at least in some respects, um, uh, the state at least is trying to reverse it. I think one of the reasons people said that is you, you looked at situations like 2009, the currency reform, um, and that kind of failed because it turned out that lots of state-owned enterprises uh, were actually dependent on the market. And when um, you tried to dispossess the tonju, it, the state-owned enterprises couldn't get the capital, they couldn't get the materials they needed, and that led to a, an impact on the state sector. So what I'm curious about is what has changed now to to over, overcome that? And, and uh, uh, has anything changed? Um, so I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm just a bit skeptical about this, this, this sort of idea that the North Korean economy is kind of doing all right and, and, and doing well and that therefore they will take conclusions from that 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 they don't need to have some kind of breakthrough uh, uh, with, 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 with the US. Uh, I mean I may be wrong I don't, I, I don't know but that, but this is um, it, it, it's it, this is one of the key questions and it's 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 difficult to um, even do the do the analysis because North Korea has been closed for the last three years very very few people coming in in and out although that seems to be changing but we've had such a lack, a lack of sources about what is actually going on in the country that it's quite difficult to come up with decent conclusions so um yeah so I don't know I'm not answering your question I'm just I'm just reiterating a, a, a sort of uh, what I think the questions are, and 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 uh, my my own lack of lack of clarity. Um, uh, it does seem, you know, I mean, like North Korea's recent sort of reformulations, reformulation of its relations with South Korea, seem to be kind of completely, you, you know, washing its hands of the idea of any kind of a, a sort of breakthrough with U.S. or U.S. allies. Um, and uh, I, I've not heard of much taking place on the US North Korean front, at least that I'm aware of. I mean, there have been some rumors about Japan um, uh, and a possible summit. I, I'm a little bit skeptical about whether that would really happen, not least because Japan itself is so for so long it's put the the abductees issue. Um so 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 yeah. Um so unfortunately I can't answer your question because I, I I just cannot predict <laughs> look into the future in, in, in that way, but also really trying to understand actually what is going on at the moment. I mean, the improved food situation is obviously a, a, a big thing in the Korean media, but, you know, this this most likely down to good weather, you know, good conditions and things like that, which may not repeat, be repeated. So, yeah, you know, but I, I just have to stop with your question there. But yeah, I, I agree um, with your reasoning. Well, well, thank you very much to Andrew as well as to Rachel. And I think we could definitely talk for another several hours about this and speculate. I think Rachel bringing up the point of the pandemic was uh, very interesting. You know, we're still wondering how that affected the common people in North Korea. A lot of information has been halted during this period, a lot of exchange or opportunity or even for defectors. And so there's not a lot of information as Kevin, you had just mentioned coming out. So I think we're gonna see interesting potential outcomes of that as things move forward. And we're all definitely gonna to keep a close eye. Now, I, I'd love to take advantage of my moderator privilege and ask other questions, but there were a couple questions that have come in. In particular, um, a lot of our viewers were curious about this question that Rachel had posed, and I will read out one, even though I think we did answer part of this as well. It's the last part of the question that I think could be interesting. 
So we have from Dr. Samuel Lee, um, and his question is a couple sentences, but I think the last part. So do you think there's any, any opening for more outward looking development model for North Korea, or is the power structure frozen in time to cling uh, to power? If yes, what could this look like? If no, will North Korea continue to be an outlier among the community of nations? And it's that last part of if no, will North Korea continue to be an outlier that I'm very curious, um, Kevin, about your take. And maybe just for the sake of time, um, I will read, we have one other question um, that has come in that I think is interesting in talking about what is, what is happening today. Are we in the midst of another historical movement? So I have a second question here from Charles Olmsted. Um, and his question is, uh, with Havana's recent move closer to Seoul, uh, send Pyongyang closer to Moscow and Beijing? Uh, and will it increase its role as an international arms dealer? And I, I don't know if we can extrapolate on that specifically, but I, there is some commentary here because we talked about China, we talked about Russia, but we haven't talked about some of these other spaces, for example, Cuba. So perhaps we can have you, uh, Kevin, respond to these questions in particular, um, since there is some interest here. Okay, so the first question about um... Could North, as I understood it, could North Korea make this transition towards a, a more sort of outward-oriented uh, economy, um, and and whether the power structure is likely to impede that? I mean, I think, you know, uh, I think yes, the power structure is a, is a, is a problem, um, and like like I point out in the in the book, it's it's something that's kind of um, sort of been formed historically over many, many years. Um, I, and uh, nonetheless, of course, we had the, we had policies in, in, in North Korea that has tried to attract uh, foreign investment. Um, you could say they went about it completely the wrong way um, and uh, it, it wasn't serious. And, and that's partly true, I think. But but then also, if we if we look to the early reforms in China as well, I mean, uh, there, there was there, there were also very, very cautious in the early stages, you know, setting up economic processing zones in the far, far as far away from Beijing as you can get um, and keeping them pretty closed. And it was not until later that they sort of gradually developed as as, as they were successful and things like that. So I, I wouldn't necessarily sort of rule these things out uh, entirely but obviously the other context is 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 sanctions now which makes that kind of approach pretty un unviable i mean it's 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 uh, unless you're talking about very small scale um traders in, in in the border regions of china i mean there's 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 very few international investors now that would take the reputational risk of investing in in in, in north korea so i certainly think in the in the current context it, that, that that's it's quite un unlikely and i think present current events you know suggestions of the direction that north korea is traveling in now so, sort of suggests this this emphasis on 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 on, on self reliance um uh in terms of the sort of havana seoul uh relations yeah yeah i mean i think i, I think that potentially i mean I'm, this has happened before though i mean this is this is not the first time a socialist state has shift well in this case not exactly shifting but you know recognizing Seoul I mean it happened with 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 China and uh, you know um uh, and and uh, uh it's 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 not necessarily sort of been a, a the sort of death blow for North Korea Chinese relations but it's just been yeah it's it's it, but it is it, it is kind of recognized as as a kind of form of betrayal so um but nonetheless I mean I mean economic relations between DPRK and, and Cuba were not really significant anyway, so I don't think it actually has a, a kind of a material impact. But it 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 does seem to, um, but I think this process of what you might call block formation within Asia just does seem to be deepening. I I think, and uh, it's it's um, so this this uh, alignment between Pyongyang and Moscow did, does seem to be a very kind of significant in terms of, of, of how we understand North Korea's relation to the external world. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for that. I think at this point, we are definitely going to have to wrap up the conversation. Um, I want to actually, if, if we have a little bit more time with all of you, maybe do a speed run just for any final thoughts or any other comments toward Kevin or thoughts about the conversation. And what I'd like to do is have perhaps Andrew go first, then hear from Rachel and have, give Kevin the last word, and we will close out the event for today. So please feel free to unmute, and we'll hear from Andrew first. Kevin already 
you preempted what I was going to ask, and I asked it around the first time, but about this access or alignment with China, Russia, and North Korea. But it's really the Russia, North Korea piece that I think has gripped most people. And we can't really predict the future. But again, I can't help but wonder if um, the geopolitical shifts right now are going to have some kind of impact on the way North Korea develops in the next you know, 10 or 15 years. Um, Kevin, you can respond to that. Or you can also say, I don't know, because none of us are prophets here, but that is the one kind of takeaway from Kevin's book that I have. And in terms of thinking about where North Korea is heading next, looking at the geopolitical development nexus. Mm -hmm. Should I answer now? Um, Actually, why don't we hear from Rachel first and then Kevin, you can respond and, and conclude everything in the last um, part. Um, I think I already talked a lot, so <laughs> I don't really have any further questions. Uh, this has been a great in, uh, discussion. I certainly um, got a lot of takeaways from it. Um, we don't really talk about North Korea's reform a lot these days because there's been so much talk about North Korea, Russia, um, you know, where North Korea is going, you know, what its intentions are, all of which are valid questions. But, you know, again, not much talk about where reform is these days. Um, so uh, I think this, uh, again, has been a uh, very uh, relevant and timely discussion, especially in the geopolitical context. Thank you. Thank you. So just to get back to Andrew, I mean, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I think we both agree it's 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 very difficult to predict. I, I would just note a, a point of caution about overemphasizing the economic significance of North Korea Russia relations. I mean, I mean, still now, of course, the China North Korea relationship is far more important in terms of its 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 external uh, trade, and and it has, as I was saying, it has recovered quite quite a bit in in, in the past year. Um, notwithstanding, you know, this this question about who is actually conducting that trade and to what extent it's it's it, it feeds into these earlier sort of marketized networks of distribution. So, so I I, I think the, the the China sort of angle is st is still probably the most important. Although, of course, the China boom is 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 not what it was, right? I mean, the Ch China also has its own uh, significant problems, and so. Um, again, I, 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 I would simply say that um, the chances of, of a return to the situation um, uh, in the mid 2010s, I, I think, are quite slim, which, of course, doesn't really bode well for North Korea, the North Korean economy, North Korean people. But, but yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I think, unfortunately, we'll have to draw everything to conclusion here, but I want to say a, a very heartfelt thank you to Kevin for reaching out and reconnecting. It's wonderful to have a former fellow come back to us and talk to us about their book. And I know you're co-author and you have done amazing work in this field. And so we are very grateful. And of course, a shout out to Andrew and Rachel as well for joining us and lending their expertise as really being experts in the field as, and able to speak to your book more deeply. So I think at this point, I uh, will unfortunately have to close, but thank you so much for uh, joining us today.